This week on Fireside Chat, we take a look at Red O'Bara's NHL debut and find out why he needs to keep on chunking. We'll look at who's playing hot and who's not, what Joey McDonald's future is, and much more. This is Fireside Chat, episode 27. Bear needs to keep on chunking. Recorded November 4th, 2013. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. We're coming off the heels of one of the most exciting Flames wins of the year, a 3-2 victory over the Chicago Blackhawks that saw a rookie goaltender in net. It was a fun game to watch, and this is Dan, Matt, and Lucas back with you for another week of Fireside Chat. How you guys doing? Very good. Nice to see them kick some ass. I'm fired the f*** up. And I think the big story from last night was the fact that Red O'Bara came up from the farm, the guy that, you know, has been there, has always been kind of that number three, but everybody I think knew was really the number two, um, or the team wanted to be the number two, and played a fantastic game. I mean, he did not look like a guy that never played an NHL game before, did he? He didn't look like a guy who played an NHL game for us this year. Um, If you watched his, just watched him move, there was an economy uh, of motion to everything he did. Everything uh, was in control there was calm in the net, and you could really tell that that sort of reverberated out to the rest of the team. Um, he he was just he was terrific, and uh, I'm looking forward to his next start. Yeah, that's one of the things that I noticed in the preseason and uh, at Windsport is that he's very collected in his crease, and he doesn't really waste any movement and is just direct with things and that's always good instead of having goalies that get out of position like both Ramo and McDonald did yeah yeah and you know I think Luke was right about saying earlier that um his calm radiated to everybody else I felt like the team played in front of him like we haven't seen them play in front of a backup goalie on this team in a while and I think that they were trying to play the game and win the game for him knowing how important this was to him I thought he looked fantastic in net. And I don't know if you guys noticed it during the preseason, but he seemed to have some issues with his uh, glove hand during preseason. He seemed like he could just couldn't, I wouldn't say use it, but he was too slow with the glove hand. And based on what I saw last night, it looks like a lot of that has been remedied. So I don't know if they've been working with him in the AHL or he's just gotten better with it naturally. I would imagine his issues with the glove were as much a result of simply not being accustomed to facing NHL or even AHL quality shots uh, prior or for the most part of his career. Uh, but once he was, I said, once he's acclimated to them, I mean, it's possible that you know the game will slow down even more for him. Uh, well, like the thing is, is that he's always played on international ice. So, yeah, all the little things of knowing where you have to be in relation to your net and all that. Like, there's so much that's going on that you have to, like, it's distracting. So, you know, him, like, being a little slow with the glove and that, like, that's kind of expected. Because, you know, he's reacting more so than, like, controlling the play. So, yeah, it's a lot better, though than even in the preseason. You know, and what Luke was saying about getting acclimated to the North American game, if that's what it takes, I'm really impressed by how quickly he's got acclimated because he's never played in North America before this season. I think he's only played like six or seven games in the um, in the AHL before this. So being able to come to North America, if he never played here, and then going through and you know, learning the game that quickly and being able to play against the Stanley Cup champions and look that good in your, you know, less than 10th game in North America, that's quite an impressive feat. For sure. And, I mean, I don't even know if uh, what what Matt was saying about internationalized to NHLized, just stuff that is a distraction. Um, I recently read a book uh, which I ended up reviewing for Impact Magazine called The Sports Gene, 
by I can't remember his name, but it was by what he's one, an editor for Sports Illustrated, and one of the things they talk about it's it's all devoted to the science of athletic performance, and they talk about um, uh, like Albert Pujols, Barry Bonds, Alex Rodriguez, uh, and a whole laundry list of uh, MLB superstars who went up to face uh, U.S. Olympic softball pitcher Jenny Finch. And Jenny Finch was throwing a softball from 40 feet away from a completely different arm angle and able to make it move in ways that they had never experienced before. And despite the fact that, you know, Albert Pujols is a guy that can take uh, an 89-mile-an-hour Brad Lidge slider and hit it 700 feet, uh, they were all completely baffled by this 110-pound blonde chick with a ponytail just mowing them down like she's Randy Johnson. And... The reason for that is because athletes, basically, everything athletes are is the, they're the sum of their experiences. And I guess, I mean, we all are, but what athletes do is they use this process, it's basically called chunking, that your mind does, and on, basically on its own, and you, um, basically what you see, you're immediately comparing it to past experiences, and that obviously applies to your recognition and hockey sense, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and the only way to get good at it is to keep doing it, I suppose. So, um, Barra has to chunk more, more t ice time on, uh, North American ice simply because, as Matt said, he's been playing on international ice. So everything he's chunked away in his career to this point is now wrong or it's off slightly. And maybe it's sort of like, um you know, changing a, your glasses prescription and just the, maybe the clarity goes up or whatever. It just, it screws with your head a bit. But the point is, Bear is going to need a little bit more time. And I thought that was a kind of a cool story. So anyway, did that make any sense? Yeah, I, I got that. So you're pretty much saying that everything, he, as much as he knows how to play the game of hockey, the game that he's playing now at this level and on a different ice surface is a different game. So it's more his instincts taking over and reacting? It is. Yeah. His, and everything he knows is slightly different. Yeah, because it's just a matter of him lining up for shots but by about six to eight inches, which isn't much, but it's enough to throw you off just that little bit. Like on the Marion Hosa goal, um, they showed a picture from behind the net where you could see from his perspective, and like he thought he had the net covered because the, the defender was in front, but there was a small sliver of space between the post and the player. And that's where Hosa shot it, but you know it. He didn't know the his angles properly on that, and like that's where he has to make adjustments to know that oh, well, if I'm here, then there's this space here that's open and all that kind of stuff. But that's just a matter of time. Exactly, and in a league where you've got you know to contend with the Mary and Hosas of the world and other elite players the best they're the best in the world at what they do so you know that six or eight inches of difference he's got to overcome that in a hurry he's got to figure it out and if he can then maybe we've got a bit more of a long-term solution than uh that, that we all hope he is i think so with that in mind let me ask each of you guys a slight a different question but still related to barra uh luke do you think that the starting job is now ramos to win back i don't think it's anyone's job at this point still as much as you can say oh it was only one game well yeah but it was one hell of a game against the defending stanley cup champions who are still playing like the defending stanley cup champions now baron needs to put a string of i would say at least four to five of these efforts together and if he does that then i think honestly then it just becomes his job and then yes it does it does become ramos to win back but. Yeah, and I agree wholeheartedly. Like, you can't really tell, like, each of the goalies that we have now, like, they have so little experience that, you know, in one game to the next, who the heck knows what you're going to get. So, you know, they need to establish themselves with a pattern of performance before, you, you know, making any determination. So you guys would probably both still play until you lose. So with that in mind, then Barrow would probably play tomorrow night in um, Minnesota. I I agree. 
I would say yes, but I don't even think at this point it's a play until you lose. I think it's play as long as you're playing well. Um, if if you know Barra makes a goes out and makes another forty saves and loses two one or something, um, he gets the next game. Like the fact that like you look at the Flames stats, uh, goaltending stats on the on their website, you've got two goalies with save percent of percentages under eight ninety and one guy with a nine fifty save percentage. So. I know save percentage isn't the be-all and end-all, but given, and I know sample size is important, but given how frantic our other goaltenders have looked to this point, um, I, I think uh, I would be very reluctant if I was a coach to throw my support behind either Ramo or McDonald uh, more than I absolutely had to at this stage of the game. So just play them till they don't look like they should be playing or play them till they need a rest and then put the other guy in and let them kind of feed off each other and may the best man win? Yeah, after tomorrow they have another day off, but then they play back-to-back. -back. So, like, you know, I'd give one to each goalie and see what they do. But, you know, as long as they're showing some consistency in how they're playing, you know, like you can give up five goals and still look like a good goalie. So, it just depends on, you know, you have to play it by year, basically. Yeah, and, and let's let's be honest. Whoever wins this job, if, say, for example, by Christmas time, Red O'Bara has established himself as the number one, just because he's the number one doesn't mean he gets a uh, Kiprasov-esque 70-game workload. Uh, I think no. whoever is the number one is still going to need to get every fourth or fifth day off. And uh, there's no sense in rushing them. We don't have a bona fide number one horse. And Ramo, if nothing else, is probably a decent backup. Might be a little bit overpaid, given what his, the market for backups is. But we're not near the cap. So, you know, yeah. the the Both goalies are going to play a lot this year. I think it would be irresponsible of the team to give one guy Kiprasov-like numbers. I mean, I thought it was irresponsible sometimes of the team to give Kiprasov Kiprasov-like numbers of games to start. So yeah, I think if one guy gets 65 or 70 games, the team's done something really bad with yeah. the way well, our crease has been managed. 65, I think, is about the upper echelon of what goaltenders should play. Uh, it, it, anything beyond that, you're really testing the limits of what they can give you. And you look at guys who've played 70 games and won the Stanley Cup in the same year, and I think the list begins and ends with Marty Brodeur. Um, it's it's not a good idea. Patrick Waugh never played more than 67 games in a year. And you have to ask yourself, is your number one better than Patrick Waugh? Was Kipper better than Patrick Waugh? As much as I love him, no, he was not. Yeah, I, and you're right. I mean, and I think that 65-game mark that you mentioned is for experienced goaltenders, which neither of these guys is either. So I think we'll probably see them split 40-odd games roughly each basically like a 50 30 or you know in between there yeah i mean realistically this team neither of these guys are at the level yet where they deserve anything beyond say the yarrow halak brian elliott treatment of a couple of years ago um and you know what that might i think that'll actually prove the best situation for this team going forward for right now until one guy establishes that he is worth 50 60 games yeah. So let me put out this theoretical. If another team calls us, sees our goaltenders having this little bit of success and offers a big package, do you move one of them? Like who? Like if, if, if say, Red O'Bear is playing well and someone calls and offers us something for Red O'Bear? Sure, yeah. Let's Or even, or even a, yeah, let's say Red O'Bear is playing well, keeps us going for 10 or so starts. Somebody calls and says, hey, we want him. He looks hot. We just lost no. our starter. Do you trade him? No, not at all. No, uh, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't either. I would ride it out and see how he does in the long term. I think there's something there. The only reason I asked is there was some talk about this today on Twitter. Some people said they'd definitely trade him if a good well, offer came by. I mean, the, the the comparable in this situation, I suppose, would be um, Ben Bishop for Corey Conacher uh, last year. Now, the only reason that trade got made was because Ottawa had potentially three guys that could start um 
I don't think we have three guys that can start. We might have just found one guy that can start. Um, and as much as I've been rooting for Ramo, uh, he does not look confident when he decides to, when he's in the net. And doesn't mean he's not good, it just means that there's something in his headspace that is preventing him from being great. And I have a small theory, it's not even a theory, it's just something I thought of last night, that I think goaltenders decide to be great. Um, I, I really do, because Kip Rasoff was a third stringer and got his opportunity and then just decided, no, this is me. I'm going to be as good as it gets. Uh, Patrick Waugh famously, you know, what did he, he won 10 overtime games in one Stanley Cup playoff run, took a team that had no business winning a championship and won, won them a Stanley Cup. Which maybe the 93 Habs are the last team that was truly a Cinderella that deserved to win. Um, or not deserved to win, that actually did win. Um, and if Barra decides to be great, then excellent for us. I don't see... So you think he has he has all the tools that are required to be a good goalie? It's just a matter of if he can mentally get to that Absolutely. zone? Absolutely. Like, there was a moment uh, last night on the 5-on-3, I think it was Kane he stopped when he did the splits on the glove save. Uh, you, remember mm. this, you remember the play? Yeah. That, that was Kane, right? Okay, so yeah. that save right there, um, there's no need for him to do the splits on that play. It opened... It, it, honestly, if he's not going glove hand, the splits is a terrible decision. However, at that moment, he is so confident and he is so in the zone that he's like, style points. And he makes a terrific save. Now, the fact that he lets in the goal to Hosa a minute later, it doesn't matter. That was a perfect shot. Nobody's stopping that goal. That, um, But that that's the sort of thing that, like, when you see a goaltender being that dominant, that's what gets you really excited as a fan. Outside of just the goaltender looking dominant last night, I thought the whole team looked really good. I thought this might have been the best effort from a lot of the guys in the team last night. And I think the fact that the overtime goal came from Chris Russell is a telling sign as far as that goes. Um... I, I don't know what you guys think, but I think Chris Russell might be the best steal on this team this year for what we paid for him and the production we're getting back. Well, realistically, I'm quite impressed all with the him. players that we acquired with fourth and fifth round picks, Colborn, Galliardi, Russell, and Corbin Knight have all looked really, really well. You know, and I can't complain with a single one of them. They're all looking like pieces that you'd actually keep on the team for a few years yeah for sure i mean russell i've been pleasantly surprised i thought russell was going to be in that dog fight for the six seven spot because i knew very little about him at beyond the fact that he played for canada's world junior team a couple of years ago uh but chris russell is a gamer uh pure and simple like he's He's not going to give up on a play. He's got some physical limitations, obviously, as evidenced by Alexander Ovechkin bowling him into Kari Ramo the other night. But, I mean, let's put it this way. If you put Chris Russell's heart in Jay Bomeister's body, you'd have a Norris winner. You'd, you'd be talking like the best defenseman in the league, hands down. Um, he's He's a really nice player, and he's easy to root for. And the fact that he cares and he makes a good first outlet pass... And, so happy he's on the team did either of you guys expect when we came into this season and when we were doing our pre uh, season episodes that we'd be getting this kind of production this kind of effort from the this team this early in the year or well, i guess it at all was this a year complete sea change from last year like the amount of effort that these guys put in on a night-to-night basis is just unbelievable so you know i i'm thrilled with it like they just don't stop and you know, I'm not used to this because, like, the last few years, it, <laughs> you know, it definitely was not anything quite like this. But, you know, it's always encouraging when they're skating hard every shift and being relentless, even if they don't have enough talent on the team. Yeah, I mean, com- compared to last year, I mean, I said this on an episode last year where, um, honestly, if I didn't have a podcast to do about this team, I'd have shut off a couple games. I'd have shut off many games. And it, it, it became, towards the end, 
a situation where I'm watching simply because is this Jerome McGinley's last game? Is this the last time I see number 12 in a flaming sea uh, come down the wing, fire something over a goalie's shoulder? I don't know. Um, and it, it was this weird, creepy sense of obligation, sort of like sitting next to the bed of a dying relative and you're not sure when it's okay for you to go home. So you just sort of stick around until the nurse tells you, visiting hours are over, sir. Um, this year, I'm just, every time I watch this team, I just, I end up smiling. Because either there's a hit, there's a chance, there's a goal. Uh, there's something in it where I'm like, all right, good for you guys. You're really trying hard. You're not, you're not, uh, you're not accepting losing. You, you, you know, you are well aware that you are not the most talented team in the world. However, you do have this attitude that, like, if we try harder than you, you know what? Our payroll's still forty something million, which is prob, you know, which is more than it was when we went to the Stanley Cup Finals with a seven million dollar Jerome Ginla. So, there's got to be some talent here, and they're playing with some pride. They're playing with heart and uh it, it's and there's always a chance some there's always something interesting that's about to happen so it, what's not to love yeah i mean you know as a fan i was not i'll be honest i was not expecting this this year i thought you know what we had some bad hockey last year and with a rebuild i thought it was just going to get worse if you will and we weren't going to see much compete we were going to see a bunch of guys who didn't really want to be here and were just trying to freelance and show that they were the best guy so they would get you know either traded or signed in the off season but i really like the compete level that we're seeing and i think going forward this is what we're going to have to get this is what we're going to have to make sure the flames teams for the next 3 or 4 years are giving us if we want to get out of this rebuild in fairly short order because i think the compete level is what's going to help Get even guys that are veterans in here working at the right work rate and you know working and Dan, hard you to get us out of here. Something that was very important. Um, you mentioned that guys who weren't happy to be here. Um, more importantly than um, anything else, just guys will be okay coming to this team if this is how we play. Every night, if we bring a consistent effort level, a consistent intensity, we, like I'm on the team, if they bring a consistent effort level and intensity, that is what attracts people to a team. It's, you know, the, the, yeah, there's a couple cities like New York and Los Angeles that have some built-in selling features, but if you want to sit there and tell me that, I, I don't know, um... You want to tell me that? Oh God, now I'm blanking on a, on a city. But I think that's how you sell a rebuild too. Is you know you come here, you sign here, and you're gonna work hard. But you know at the end of the day, it's gonna be for a and cause. And we're gonna have success. And I guess my my point was like I suppose if, if you think that you know Dallas or Columbus or hell even Philadelphia has that much more going for it than a Calgary then that's being disingenuous. At the end of the day, they're all just cities. They, and honestly, would you sign in Philadelphia? Well, I mean, I'd sign in Philadelphia now because Paul Holmgren's insane enough that he'd probably give me three years and a no-move clause. But would you sign in Philly as a hockey player at the moment? Or would you kind of be like, oh, maybe I'll play with Giroux, but I'd like to see what else is available? Well, I think if Calgary's available, especially after this year, it's going to it's going to have to be something that you would look at where you may have written them off last summer thinking they lost Jerome. They lost, they're probably losing Kipper. They lost Bo. The team's going to go nowhere. I think that you'd now have to give them another look if they keep playing like this all year. Well, additionally, like the flames will have at least $12 million more coming off the books because all of stage and Stepniak and Camilleri are free agents. So like, if we don't retain them, like you know, we're just above the floor as it is. So, you know, it's a inviting place because you look at the team and, like, while Camilleri is doing good, you have, you know, the rest of the team is doing well as well. So, you know, if you had, you know, a free agent here and there that is a legit, like, 4 or $5 million player, 
and then you add guys like Gaudreau and Poirier and Klimchuk coming in, you know, like, you might actually get a playoff caliber team even as soon as next year if they keep this level of play up, as ridiculous as that sounds. <laughs> you know what's crazy? Out of the three guys you just listed, Camilleri, Stage, and Stepniak, the way organizationally our depth is shaping up, especially on the wings, the guy out of all of those you might want to bring back just from a position of need is Stajan. Because Stajan's been playing absolutely terrific since he's come back from injury. Uh, he, he has been, like I, I said a couple weeks ago, he always looks like he's just half a step behind. Like he's not slow, but he's just, he plays to the level of his competition. And he's done more driving of the play in the last two weeks than I think I've seen from him his entire tenure in Calgary. Yeah, I can't really argue with that. No, and, you know, again, that's, I think, what we want to be seeing right now is these guys who perhaps in the past didn't step up also stepping up and showing that they are part of this team and they have the work rate that's required to be a Calgary Flame this year. And maybe maybe it is just to get a new deal in the off season, but, hey, I'll yeah. take it for I mean, this year. Given the, okay, given that the three and a half years before this stage and hasn't been great, if he continues this level of play up for the next 70 games, are you comfortable re-signing him, or do you still think it would be time to move on? Or, or by the deadline, so, so to speak. Because I think if Matt Stajan keeps this level of play up, but he's worth at least a second in April. Yeah, I'd still likely trade him just because we have uh, Colborne, Knight, Backland, and Monaghan already like quasi-pro-ready you know, so, you know, from a depth perspective, it might be better to cycle in a, another young player in. But, you know, it it would do nothing but improve the trade value, that's for sure. <laughs> I think I'd, I think I'd hang on to Stajan. Okay, why? Um, I think part of it is, as much as we do have all these young centers, I've always been a believer that you do need some guys that know how to play the game to help lead. And I think he, he could be that guy, he could be that veteran, maybe not the leader, but the veteran centerman if you will who can help these guys show them what it means to be an nhl center i also think it's just good to have a veteran around i mean yes maybe we have other guys that we could use you can always flip them in the off season you can flip them at the draft you can flip them next season but i think it keeps options open staging well i mean if we don't extend him he just walks right right but i'm saying i would extend him okay because of those reasons so yeah i'd keep him around and extend him I wouldn't give him a no movement, but I'd extend God, the contract no, yeah, without I, a I no movement. That. I would. Here's what I would do. I would keep him in the sense that if all you're going to do is go out and sign another fringe top six centerman who's not had a lot, if any, playoff experience, um, then just keep staging because you'll probably be able to get a hometown discount or something. Um if you are going to give bigger roles to your Reinhardt's, Corbin Knights, Monahans, Backlands of the world, then you let him go. And also, in the event you want to replace Stajan through free agency, I don't know who's available this coming off season, but I would really hope that they go after a guy uh, who's got some Stanley Cup experience, at least someone who's been to the conference finals in the last couple of years and been around a winner. Uh, sort of like the way the Leafs uh, went out and got David Boland. Um, th- that's the sort of move I could, I'd really want them to make when they're going to replace staging. Because I do think, like Dan said, we need a veteran presence at center. We can't have four centers with less than 250 games of NHL experience. That's not going to work. That makes us into the Oilers. If I may. Um, remember a couple of years ago when the Flames played the Devils and Zach Parise came around the net and TJ Brody just wallpapered him? And Zach Parise said afterwards, like, oh, just some guy trying to make a name for himself. That's why he hit me. Well, suck it, you prima donna, $98 million whiner. Yeah. TJ Brody has been beasting. Last night against Chicago was his best game of the year by far. He just he was owning Taves all night long. And Jonathan Taves, I would also I'll, I'll say it. Jonathan Taves, if I had to start a franchise with one player, it'd be him, and not Crosby because Jonathan Taves actually plays games. If, if Sidney Crosby was made of adamantium, yeah, I'd take him. But Jonathan Taves, 
my guy to start a franchise with. And TJ Brody was all over him last night. And he threw him into the net and got some and people booed the non call. But like TJ Brody, this is why I bought this I got this dude lettered on my jersey and went out on a limb and put an A on it. Because He's an absolute stud, and this is the guy you build around. Yeah, last year was looking good, and I think we were all trying to figure out if it was a one-year thing, if it was a flash in the pan or not, and I think this year is panning out to show us, yeah, this guy's NHL material, and this is the kind of guy we hope to see yeah, here for well, a long time Ever since come. Giordano went down with injury, uh, Luke's favorite player, Chris Butler, has been paired with him, and... Ever since then, he's even Butler is looking like a very good defenseman. Like I think he had 26 minutes last night with Brody, and like he looked just as good. But, Butler, honestly, Butler has been looking. I, I mean, I'm not about to get a tattoo of him on my calf, but Butler has been looking really, really good for the last at least four or five games. He's been physical. He's been active. He's been blocking shots. He's been making smart plays. Offensively, he still has all the instincts of a drunk basset hound. But he has been a really tough competitive defenseman. And, you know, I, I suppose it, it, it's sad that it took a bad injury to Mark Giordano to, to get this to happen. But awesome that Butler is stepping up. I don't want to hate Butler. Understand this. This isn't some sort of, like, you know... We need a whipping boy. I need someone to hate. Butler, you'll do. It's that Butler is so maddeningly frustrating with his previous heretofore lack of execution or compete or just general awareness on the ice. And now that he's actually, you know, doing well, good for him. I'm really happy. Good. Go, Chris. It probably is, although if you'll remember, I believe... So let, let's make a note here. It's episode 27, and for the first time, we have Luke saying, Go Chris Butler. That well, may be a first in our show go away, history. Chris Butler. <laughs> you know, he's, I'm sure he's very special to a lot of people. I just want him to be as special to the city of Calgary as Sean Monaghan and Sven Berti are. I only want the best for you, Chris. Just remember that. Luke's just looking out for your best interest. He's giving you constructive feedback every week. So with everything that's happened with Barra coming up and all the uh, praise that we've given him this week, we have to remember that, that means somebody else had to sacrifice a spot on this team, and that was Joey McDonald, who's now cleared waivers. Nobody took him, even though he was free to be taken by any of the other 29 teams, and he's now sitting in the AHL. And I asked you guys this question before we started recording tonight. Do you think he stays in the AHL? Do you think he even plays a game down there? Do you think the Flames will be sending him out of here? I, I don't even it? think he'll get not many starts like maybe like one or two a month yeah the development time is for Ordeo and Brossois so you know and I'm sure that other teams like once they have injury troubles they might ask to get them off of us especially if it's like a shorter term injury because once they recall McDonald like he can play x number of games before having to return without having to go through waivers again. So, it, you know, it's basically, like, that's it for Joey McDonald on the Flames, unless there's injuries, and that's it. Because no one wants to claim Joey McDonald on waivers and have to keep him up all year or risk going having him come back to us. So, I mean, if Feaster can swing a seventh for Joey McDonald, there's got to be someone out there who wants, want, wants him. You can't, like, the New York Rangers have got, like... A crappy backup situation. They just waved Marty Biron. The Boston Bruins, the backup for the Boston Bruins is Chad Johnson. And not that Chad Johnson, but the other one. There, there's a market for, yeah, there's a white, there, there, there's a white, there's a market for Joey McDonald. And, uh, but it's, it's not through waivers. It, it sort of works to his own detriment and sucks that, you know, he, he's an NHL backup, but he doesn't have a role on this team. He has a role on a different team. And as soon as that happens, I have every reason to believe that this management group will send him on his way and get an asset in return. And then we'll be like, oh my god, sixth round pick, way to go, Feaster. Now he's in the AHL, do you, do you think that he has now fallen down the depth chart? Do you think he's still the number three guy, if you will, because he's the backup who got sent down? Or do you think he's now behind Ordeo in the depth chart? Sorry, I was not super impressed with Ordeo in the, in the prospect camp. 
Yeah, I don't consider McDonald to even be in the depth chart anymore, really, because, yeah, I'd rather see either Ordeo or even Brossois get a shot back in the NHL before him, because, you know, McDonald's a known quantity as being a bottom five-ish backup in the lot in the league and yeah he'll he'll be adequate but not anything to really write home about at least with either Ordeo or Brossois you don't know what you're getting so yeah I'd go that route instead yeah for sure and like Joey McDonald is the is the kind of guy you'd need if you had a 70 game goalie on your roster uh, like he'd be great in New York. He'd be great. Well, that's the role he was brought in to do in this team. He was brought in to back up Kippersoff. Yeah, fair enough. So yeah, I mean that's that's his role. Like, hell, I mean if he went back, well, not to Detroit because they've got Mrazek and Gustafson. So, I mean, the, I think there's a place for him, but he's a 33 year old known quantity, as Matt said, or commodity. Um, yeah, I think he'll be an NHL player again, just not in a flaming sea. I think that they'll find a home to move him to, and he'll, you know... I mean, if Curtis McElhaney can keep an NHL job, Joey McDonald will be able to keep an NHL job. So I think we'll see him in the NHL again, just not here. I think you guys are right. He's off the depth chart. His time is done. Well, I guess, you know, other guys that perhaps are having a rough time here in Calgary, besides um, just McDonald, would be some of the rookies. And we've seen some interesting handling of the rookies i guess over the past couple days we've seen berchi backland and i believe boma all benched in the last couple games are you guys surprised to see that the rookies are getting benched and other guys getting some ice time instead of them not at all like this is what a rebuilding team needs is a coach that's willing to sit people if they're not performing as good as their talent level should be producing like Sven Berchi realistically should be at least a 50 to 60 point player in the NHL. But he hasn't really been showing a lot of consistency in his overall game, so having him sit for a bit, you know, and even getting uh, reduced ice time yesterday, you know, it's trying to kick him to, you know, get them to produce properly like at, at their skill level instead of you know just doing the whole Edmonton thing <laughs> yeah just because your birthday starts with a 199 uh doesn't mean you get preferential treatment when it comes to ice time um that's what happens to the Oilers now the Oilers in I suppose their defense probably thought that with all the games their young players missed due to injury that was as good as sending out as healthy scratching them so they could learn something but our guys actually you know they need to be held accountable and if anyone thinks that as much as i love sven and hell backland um if they've been not if, if they're beyond reproach uh well you're wrong they, you know, there's been lots of stuff to like about their both of their games, but to say that both of them couldn't benefit from once every ten games watching from the press box and just achieving, you know, being given a measure of humility and perspective, uh, I, I've got no problem with it, and I applaud Hartley for having the balls to not uh, bow to young players just because they like they're young, that like. There's more to it than that. I think some of this goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the work rate of this team, and I think everyone's expected to contribute something, and I think everyone has a different level. And like you said, good on Hartley that if you're not producing and you're not doing what this team needs you to do, you're going to sit down and think about what you need to do, and someone else will take your spot. And good for us for having the depth, even if it is Jackman, that we can slot a guy into that spot when that happens. Well, like it's not like he's being... Hartley's being unrealistic with ice time and like the rookies are getting eight minutes a night regardless of how good they do like we've seen with both Brody and Joel Colborn like they're both performing well and then you see their game ice time increase a bit here a bit there and you know then they're playing 20 plus minutes a night or in Brody's case nearly 30 minutes 
you know, because they're actually responding positively with their ice time. Like, I think Colborn had two assists last night, you know, and he's been consistently getting better offensively. So, you know, it's not unrealistic that he should get more ice time because he's actually stepping up and playing well. Rewarding those who play well. What an interesting concept. Yeah, I mean, Joe Colburn is one of those guys who I've been looking at him and just hoping, he'll, or not hoping, I'm, I'm waiting for him to break out because he's involved, he's engaged. There's stuff that's nearly happening for him, but it's not quite. And, I mean, he's... I, I'm just looking at the summary last night. Colburn had... Just the one assist. But, I mean, he, he's getting better. And you know what? Despite the fact results might not be there yet, he's got some chemistry with Galliardi and Camilleri. He's seeing the ice very well. And his size is a definite asset on a line with a five foot eight or whatever it is, Mike Camilleri. Um, and especially with Galliardi also wreaking havoc there. Like, they're really effective. And, you know goes back to all these great moves we've made with fourth and fifth round picks like colborne's been terrific I, I i think anyway as much as you can expect him to like if you expect him to come in and be joe thornton well then you're just setting your own yourself and the kid up for a uh, crushing disappointment but yeah i think he's played better than expected and that's really what we can expect from him is better than what we're expecting him to do he's not a star by any means but he's pulling his own weight and he's contributing positively to the team it's been a couple weeks since we've all been live. Uh, last week was the jersey unveiling, and we didn't do a show last week together, all three of us. Um, but the Flames played a lot of games and a lot of road games over the past two weeks. Um, any particular games or moments of games over that time that anyone wants to highlight or talk about or point out? Well, the effort level in each of the games was there. And that, to me, is the most important thing. Like... Yeah, there was that Dallas game where we lost 5-1, you know, and on and on and on. But, you know, at least they are giving a consistently determined effort. And even though the results might not necessarily be there on the scoreboard, at least they're getting the good habits. And, you know, as they insert more talent over the next year or two, you know, then they'll, if they keep this level of effort up then they should start seeing the benefits of that effort you gotta lay the foundation and i mean you you know that you're in you know renovation and contracting but luke you've done work there you know you gotta lay the foundation a solid foundation makes everything that much better and that much more stable i think that's what they're doing this year is they're laying that solid foundation that's gonna carry them through many more years Oh, uh, br very briefly, um, to go back to what I said a bit about goaltenders deciding to be great, uh, I think you can see an awful lot of that, sort of just deciding to be great, in Sean Monaghan. And that's the sort of thing, one, that makes him, that you know, I'm sure that, that made the Flames pick him with the sixth overall pick, but also the it's the sort of thing that tells you, this is our next captain. Does anyone think there's any chance that Sean Monaghan's not given the C when it comes available? After 10 games, or for 13, whatever. I, I don't know he'd be my next captain. I think I might give him an A in a couple of years, but I'm not sure I'd make him the next. I think he'll be captain eventually, but I'm not sure I would make him the next captain of this team. Yeah, it also depends on like who we draft next year and so on. Like You just don't know yet. Like There's too many factors to weigh in. But yeah, he definitely will be a leader on the team. You know, even if he, you know, it's like uh, when uh, Conroy was the captain, you had Aginla there in a leadership role, even though, you know, he didn't have the C. So, you know what I mean? Like, and you, need, you know, you can't have just, like, one guy being, like, the go-to leader. You need, like, f four or five. No, definitely. I understand that. I'm just thinking that when Giordano either... I, I mean, when Giordano moves on or perhaps just decides to give up the C, which I don't I don't necessarily know if that's necessary. That's not in the cards right now. I'm not saying don't give up the C yet, Gio. You're, you're a great captain. Hurry back. We need you. Um, I, I'm just thinking that I, I even no matter who we draft, even if we drafted McDavid in two years, 
I would still see Sean Monahan being the captain of this team after Mark Giordano. Yeah, I think you might have guys, younger guys who are further along their development, like a Brody perhaps take that role first. Yeah, well, I, I could see that happening. As I said, I've, I mean, I've got the A stitched on my sweater already, but I would still think that Brody is always going to be a an alternate, an A guy, um, whereas Monahan is, I mean, he, Monahan's the guy. Just everything about him is the guy. Um, the... the you, you don't luck your way into the production he's had thus far and the, the kind of goals he's scored. You, you get to exactly where he is right now by a, like, not, maybe not Crosby-like, but, you know, borderline psychotic desire to be better than everyone else and to prove yourself. And that's the sort of thing you want from the guy who's going to lead your team. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. And I, I think, as Matt said, leadership can come in different forms too. I'm just, I'm not convinced he's the, I think he will be a captain. I'm just not convinced he's the next captain. And Who knows, maybe Gio will be here a long time. And by that time, it will be time for him to be captain. But I don't see him, let's say I don't see him being captain in the next five or six seasons. Assuming Giordano is here, I don't see it happening before Giordano leaves. But once that position becomes available, I would, I mean, I don't see anyone in the organization now who you'd give it to before him. No, maybe not in the organization, but I think when this team starts becoming competitive, there will be people coming in, larger names through trade and that sort of thing. And those are the guys that I think might get it before he does. Okay, let's look at the last... Let's look at Stanley Cup winners uh, through the lockout. Um, there's, or no, not through the lockout. Let's, let, let's look at the last five Stanley Cup winners. Um, so that would be Chicago, Los Angeles, Boston, sh- uh, Chicago, again, uh, and Pittsburgh, and Detroit. So the captains of those teams were Lidstrom, Crosby... Taves, Chara, Dustin Brown, Taves again. Those are that six Stanley Cups. But the only one of them that's not a homegrown drafted player is Zdeno Chara. And he came to a franchise in a situation where they had nobody as far as leadership was concerned. They... The, the, that, the, the team was a wasteland, so to speak. Yeah, no, and I agree with you. I think that eventually Sean Monaghan will be captain here. I just, I guess it depends how long uh, Gio has the C, but I don't see Monaghan I- any time in the foreseeable future, let's say the next five, six years, wearing that C. Even if, Mo- even if Gio were to leave. Yeah, well, ooh, no. If Gio leaves, I think he's the guy. But I don't see a situation where prior to your current captain leaving, they do a thing where, like, Dallas takes the C off Mike Medano and gives it to Brendan Morrow. Um, I think in as long as Giordano's here, we'll probably see him wearing the C as long as he's playing at a high level, unless he gave it up willingly. But even then, I think there'd have to be a pretty either de- sharp decline in Gio's play and a rapid ascent in Monahan's. But I think you know four or five years from now, when things are a little bit different and the time is right, then. It's going to be there. I don't see a Landeskog situation happening, but... So we, we've we shown tonight, I think, that everyone is excited about this team again. We had some rough patches. I think the game against the defending champions has really lifted our spirits. And this week we got three games, all road games. We have the uh, Wild coming up, and then we have a back-to-back with the Blues and the Avalanche. And I think we can get out of this uh, road st- road stretch not looking too bad. That's my hope anyways. I hope that we see a lot more Red Obara and we can see what he's got to offer us. Why don't we wrap this thing up? Um, I'll just, I will say that you can find us as usual on our website, firesidechat.ca. You can uh, find us on Twitter, at Fireside Podcast. We're on Facebook, facebook.com slash firesidechat. And you can subscribe to our latest episodes through iTunes or Stitcher. We're available through all of those venues that we'll see y'all next week and let's hope that we have a great week of flames hockey to talk about absolutely follow me on twitter at luke 1701 suck it tom We are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show we know you're looking for us but now we have to go 
Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.